So thank you guys for joining us, um, especially in these nicer months. I know Fridays, it's hard to log in and be in the office and do these things. Um, this Friday, Focus for Health is hosted by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization for North and South Dakota. My name is Carolyn Tufty. I am a nurse by background and a quality improvement advisor for the Great Plains Quinn. I am here with my um, with my team, Tammy Wagner, Terry Sorensen, and Kelsey Olson and Jennifer Lochner. We want to thank you all for joining us today. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted within one to two business days on our website at greatplainsquin.org under the Friday Focus for Health link tab. This link is always be, is also being shared with you in the chat. If you have questions, please add them to the chat. We have added a resource handout that you can access. This resource handout includes all resources shared during today's session and will be added to as the four week series occurs. During this four week series, we have discussed different types of infections, including sepsis, pneumonia, and healthcare or facility acquired infections. Today, we will dive into wound and skin infections. Wounds are defined as injuries or any disorders that compromise the skin, in skin integrity to the skin structure that are caused by extra stringent factors such as cuts, burns, or pressure, or things such as surgery or pathological conditions like diabetes or vascular diseases. Given the complexity of wound healing and the multiple factors that affect healing, wound care can be a challenge. Chronic health conditions and multiple comorbidities such as diabetes, cancer, or heart failure must all be considered. The plan of care must address the whole person and consider any assistance the person may need due to physical or mental deficits nutritional needs, family support, wound care strategies, and reimbursement. Wound infection continues to be a challenging problem and presents a health care burden. Most wounds contain microorganisms. Many heal successfully with proper cleansing and wound care. However, microorganisms and bacteria can multiply, invade, and damage tissues that delay healing and cause systemic infections. And as we alluded to earlier, the risk of infection is increased by advanced age, malnutrition, low fluid volume, obesity, steroid use, diabetes, use of immunosuppressive medications, and smoking. And that list is not a comprehensive list. There are other factors that can affect it as well. There are four stages um, in that occur when you have a wound. Phase one is homeostasis. This is the initial stage. This occurs immediately after injury. Um, that is when the body attempts to stop bleeding through vascular constriction and scab formation involving platelet aggregation. Phase two is the inflammation phase, and this is typically days one through four. Um, this is the body's normal response to injury. This phase activates vasodilation, leading to increased blood flow, causing heat, redness, pain, swelling, loss of function. Wound oozing may be present. Um, phase three, which is usually days three through 24, is the proliferative phase. This is the time when the wound is healing. The body makes new blood vessels, which cover the wound. This phase includes reconstruction and epithelialization. The wound will gradually become smaller as it heals. Phase four is tissue remodeling phase. This is typically days 24 up to 365. This is the final phase of healing when scar tissue is formed. The wound at this stage is still at risk and should be protected where possible. This slide just gives you an example of acute versus chronic wounds. Um, and this is just informative. Acute wounds is the new or increasing pain, arrhythmia, local warmth, swelling, drainage, maybe fever. Um, and the chronic is a lot of those same characteristics, but that would include maybe peri wound edema, um, bleeding or friable skin, wound bed discoloration, granulation tissue, and things of that nature. Um, so some wound bed types to just be aware of. Granulating is healthy red tissue, which is deposited during the repair process of full thickness wounds. 
It presents this pinkish reddish color, moist tissue, and com com comprises of newly formed collagen, elastin, and capillary networks. The tissue is well vascularized and bleeds easily. Epithelialization is a process by which the wound surface is covered by new epithelium. This begins when the wound has filled with granulation tissue. The tissue is pink and occurs as the primary closure mechanism, mechanism of partial thickness wounds and atop a healthy granulation tissue in a full thickness wound. Sloth is the presence of yellowish tissue that can be stringy or thick. Sloth is formed by an accumulation of dead cells and should not be confused with pus. Eschar or necrotic tissue is wound containing dead tissue. It may appear hard, dry, and black. Dead connective tissue may appear gray. The presence of dead tissue in a wound prevents healing. Hypergranulation is granulation tissue um, that grows above the wound margin. This occurs when the proliferative phase of healing is prolonged and is usually the result of increased moisture. So this next, oh, okay. I have my slides out of order, sorry. Um, wound measurements is an essential component of wound assessment. It should be done in the initial visit and at regular intervals. Various methods are available to measure wounds and it is important to use the same method each time with the patient in the same position. Wounds are typically measured first by its length, width, and depth. And now Tammy is gonna share this short video and it's just gonna describe and show um, the proper way to measure wounds and it's gonna include tunneling and undermining measurements. Hello. One of the things I'd like to do is spend a few minutes to demonstrate the concepts of undermining and tunneling because those seem to be issues that a lot of clinicians struggle with and really have some concerns about what exactly those mean. When we talk about tunneling and undermining, those are really a type of dead space that we see in the wounds. One of the things that we do as part of our comprehensive wound assessment is to look at the length, the width, the depth of the wound, and also for the presence of any dead space such as tunneling or undermining. When we talk about tunneling, a tunnel is generally a tract in the wound. It usually is, is one directional. Using this particular uh, mannequin, I would like to just demonstrate what tunneling looks like. So whenever you're assessing a wound, you're gonna be using a sterile Q-tip. Typically, if I am going to be measuring the length, the width, and the depth of the wound, this patient's head would be at 12 o'clock, the feet would be at six o'clock. So I would be measuring the length this way head to toe orientation. I would be measuring the width this way, side to side orientation. And then I would be measuring the depth using a sterile applicator and finding the deepest part of the wound and holding it perpendicular to the base of the wound. And that would allow me then to determine what my depth is. That's pretty straightforward for most clinicians. But when we have tunneling, tunneling is generally a tunnel or tract. And in this case, I have a patient who has a tunnel this is a patient, his head is here. Therefore, if I am using the face of the clock, which is what you would use to describe the orientation, this would be a tunnel that measures approximately three and a half centimeters, and it's located at about the seven o'clock position. So we have a tunnel at the seven o'clock position. That is a tunnel. In terms of undermining, undermining really refers to an area where the edges of the wound are not attached. There is basically a shelf or a lip underneath the wound. So to measure undermining, what I would do is again, use a sterile tipped applicator and I would find, and you can see as I hold this Q-tip parallel to the wound, that it goes right in and there is a little shelf or a little uh, lip, if you will. So in this case, I am finding that there is undermining from here all the way over to here, quite a bit of undermining. So what I would use again is the face of the clock and I would describe this as approximately Oh, two centimeters, I would say, of undermining from about the 11 o'clock position all the way over to the two o'clock position. So that is undermining. This is tunneling. The other thing that's very important, just to reiterate, is whenever you have any depth or dead space in the wound, it's absolutely critical to pack that wound, not to overpack it, not to pack it too tightly, but to just gently fill those areas. That's a very critical part of your wound care. 
Thank you. We must, did we lose her? I am thinking so. Okay, we must have lost her. All right, well, until we get her back on, I will continue on with the presentation. Wound drainage, we'll talk about next. So when we talk about wound drainage, we're talking about uh, these different types we have serous serosanguinous hey stephanie if you see her pop on let me know i don't want to take over for her but um okay i will do okay. that all right sanguinous purulent and hemo purulent and then exudate exudate is produced um by all acute and chronic wounds as part of the natural healing process and it plays an essential part in the healing uh, in the healing process. Uh, exudate contains nutrients, energy, and growth factors for metabolizing cells. It also contains high amounts of white blood cells, and it cleanses the wound. Exudate also maintains a moist wound environment. Um, it promotes epithelialization. It usually is amber or straw colored. Uh, and it's similar to plasma. Uh, it's important to assess and document the type, amount, and odor of the exudate to identify any changes. Too much of uh, any exudate leads to maceration of the skin area and hypergranulation of the tissue. And while too little can result in the wound becoming too dry. Oops, go back. Wound edges. So proper assessment of the surrounding skin is crucial to uh, wound care and treatment. The surrounding skin should be examined carefully. The tissue might present as healthy. It could be macerated, dry, or flaky. Um, it could be black, blue, discolored, fragile, uh, erythema, induration, or hardening. Um, could look at cellulitis. Pain associated with chronic wounds can be underestimated, and it's important that the pain scores are captured accurately and regular, regularly to ensure that patients have a active role in dealing with uh, their pain. Effective pain relief can be achieved and documented um, Numerous evidence-based pain assessment tools are available, including the 0 to 10 pain scale, the Wong-Baker faces scale, and the FLAC or pain ad scale. Pain scores should be clearly documented and reported to uh, the clinician or provider. It's important to have an accurate assessment of pain before, during, and after dressing changes and uh, might provide uh, vital information for further wound management. So you can see here two wound edges, you know, look at the color, if it's raised, rolled, contracted, and then that sensation. We want to highlight some uh, tools. We don't know if you've ever seen the head to toe infection prevention toolkit that CMS has. This was created from some CMP uh, funds. And I think this was developed in 2017. One aspect of this um, toolkit is the skin care and um, this is just making the connection to infection prevention um, the head to toe infection prevention toolkit was cre created for long-term care by cms through those cmp funds it includes a handbook observation guide staff presentation and implementation guide a suspected infection investigation tool um, a resource for residents, and a customizing care tool. The toolkit includes three areas of preventing infections by maintaining mouth, skin, and urinary health. 
And today we're just um, highlighting skin briefly because we're talking about wounds. Um, but uh, this is a great resource and you can use it in your education for your residents, families and staff. And so this next page is just showing you one little excerpt of it just to get your interest. This talks about pressure uh, injuries. Um, just again to highlight it. And then um, these are just screenshots. These are on our website and they'll also be in the resource document. This is our GP Quinn SBAR wound and skin provider communication um, that we created for you to use to, again, use SBAR to provide that communication to um, your providers, your clinicians. And then we also developed a wound culture competency for you to utilize. Carolyn's still not, not around? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So we also want you to be able to leave in action because we're a quality improvement organization. We want you to use those quality improvement tools. So we have the quality improvement project guide uh, for you and a link in the resource document. Um, but leaving in action, we want you to um, plan, identify an opportunity and plan what needs to be changed related to wounds, if that's what you want to work on. Uh, what needs to be done to improve the implementation of evidence-based pressure, injury, or wound guidance. Select the appropriate intervention and identify indicators for that evaluation. Do implement changes on a small scale. Consider interventions that are needed and that are possible. Um, use skin assessment tools as part of a comprehensive pressure ulcer wound uh, prevention program. Conduct the review of implementation of clinical practice guide, uh, guidelines related to wound management or pressure ulcer prevention. Document observations, including any problems and unexpected findings. Collect data that you identified as needed during the plan stage. Define your wound infections or if you're having issues with pressure injuries. Um, identify risk factors. Is it impaired mobility, um, activity, nutritional assessments, um, moisture, advanced aging, friction and shear, sensory perceptions? Um, maybe it could be overall health status. Um, what assessment tool are you using? Are you using Braden scale? Um, skin assessment your skincare routine or procedure, uh, nutritional assessments, hydration, um, adequate protein intake, and then study, collect the data, evaluate it for patterns and trends, assemble a team of practitioners to help analyze and study the data to determine whether the interventions made a difference, and then act for successful and ongoing changes, broaden the intervention, and continuously assess results. What did you conclude? Make any recommendations or modifications to ensure improvement and appropriate um, implementation of the evidence-based clinical practice guidance and interventions and spread. And finally, we're closing out this last four week uh, session, Up Your Protection from Infection Series, and we're gonna leave you with this. How can patients help prevent healthcare associated infections? So we're gonna watch this video. Anytime we get sick, we wanna get well as quickly as possible. As a doctor, there's a lot I can do to help. But when I'm a patient, I also play a critical role in my own care. If you or a loved one is a patient, there are things that you can and should do to ensure that you get the safe and correct care that you deserve. I encourage my patients to be advocates for their own health. And here are five things that I encourage everyone to do. First, remember, clean hands save lives. Cleaning our hands is one of the most effective ways to prevent the spread of diseases. When you're a patient, watch your healthcare team and ensure that everyone cleans their hands before they touch you every time. If they forget, help them remember. 
The same goes for your visitors. Second, be alert to changes in your own health. For example, if you're currently taking or have recently taken antibiotics and you develop diarrhea, let your healthcare provider know. If you have a catheter in your vein and the skin around it becomes red or painful, let someone know. If you do have a catheter, ask every day if it's time for that catheter to come out. Third, take antibiotics only when your provider thinks you need them. If you take antibiotics when you don't need them, you're only exposing yourself to unnecessary side effects. If you do need antibiotics, take them exactly as they're prescribed. Fourth, get a flu shot every year. The CDC recommends that everyone over the age of six months get a flu shot every year. Getting a flu shot is a simple way that we can protect not only ourselves, but our loved ones as well. And finally, speak up. Ask questions about your care. Know what medicines you're taking and why you're taking them. If you have concerns about your health or your care, share those concerns with your providers. The information that you share might be critical in getting you the care that you need. As a doctor, the more I know about my patients, the more I can do to help them. At CDC, we believe that providing safe medical care is a team effort, and patients are a critical part of that team. By following these steps, you can help ensure that you get the safe and correct care that you deserve. All right, we're going to move to questions and open discussion. If anyone has a question about wounds, wound infection, that last video, if anybody shares that with their families or residents, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us on our G GP Quinn team. Um, has anyone seen any questions come through chat yet? Nope, I see Stephanie shaking yep. her head. Nothing yet. Okay. I'm going to move it to this just quick. Um, we're going to promote our next Friday Focus for Health. Our June series is Chronic Kidney Disease Prevention, Manage, and Protect That Kidney Health. And I know, uh, Care, I think Kelsey put that in the chat. Go ahead and register for that. Um, so that will be the Fridays in June from 12.15 to 12.45. And then uh, we we aren't ending yet because I do have some polling questions, um, but we're going to hang on this because we do uh, really appreciate when people complete the evaluations. Um, we usually get two or three. We'd like to see a few more if possible, so you can use the QR code or I know Kelsey again is going to put that link <laughs> into chat. Um, but I'm going to put a polling question out there related to wounds. It's going to take just a couple minutes here. Okay, the first one is launching it now. Does your organization require routine skin assessments? And the second one is going to be a follow up to that after we get done with this one. So you'll be thinking about it. Um, it's just how often. And we're going to put that in a word cloud. So does your organization require routine skin assessments? I'm going to assume yes, because I think it's a requirement. So hopefully that's 100% yes. Tammy, can you see the results? I cannot yet. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Right now, we are sitting at 83% saying yes. Okay. And 16% saying NA. Okay. So we have six total responses. Okay.
All right, then I'm going to launch the next. Which is how often does your organization require skin assessments? So we can put in. Every eight hours, 24, you can put in on admission, whatever. I'm going to launch that. Well, just it's a word cloud, so just put in a number or daily. Change of condition, weekly, okay. We have two weekly, weekly and PRN, or so mainly weekly change of condition. So is it mainly um, week, like weekly with their bath? Is we that have, a nurse? Yep. No. Um, head to toe skin assessment. Is it a bath aid? Is it a nurse? So we have a couple comments coming in, right. Tammy. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yes. It, Tamara says with their bath. Shelly says yes with their bath. Jessica says weekly on bath days, also on admission, change of condition, and PRN. Mm -hmm. um, the nurse must do. Yep. And Tamara says yes, nurse. Mm -hmm. okay. Very good. Oops. Shelly H then come ba comes back and says CNA radios nurse when they're doing the bath so the nurse can assess. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Can I add something? This is Jennifer. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good idea to do a skin assessment after a resident's been out, like with family or out on a whole day excursion or something, just, just in case something might have happened and no one really knows about it. And then if you find something, you at least can talk to family or whoever they were out with right away and find out what happened. I think that's a great suggestion. When I was director of nursing, I don't know how many uh, how many times the bruises that showed up or the skin uh, skin tears that you know when when they come back and you don't know, you call them. Oh, we did. We don't know what happened. You don't know what happens. You have to report that and do that whole investigation, not just on you know. The, the pressure injuries if they didn't if they didn't uh, move in their wheelchair for multiple hours, well that can damage and start that pressure injury. Then then you own that. It's just not enough time in the day, is there? All right, I have another, I know it's almost time, but I have another one just because I wanted to try this new poll. <laughs> it is, I think it was called a quiz. I don't know if it's going to work, but you put them in order. So place the wound phases in order. I'm going to launch this. So it's from the information that was given. So it's either, I think you can just move them around. I'm gonna go back. Oh, there we go. So, 
move them around and then hit submit and we're going to see if this works so we can use this in the future if it if it indeed works you tell me if uh i am it. seeing i'm seeing six responses that come in thus far and from what i can tell they're all the same answer. OK, so, yes. So and it's shows... seven. Now we are okay. up to seven and all the same. OK. All right. Thank you. And that is our time. Did we get any questions? I'm sorry, I should have. I should have not just done that, but OK. No. Thank you, everybody, for attending our four weeks of uh, up your protection from infection, please fill out our Friday Focus evaluation. Kelsey just stuck that link in there again. We appreciate and, and please register for our June series. And have a great holiday weekend. Happy Memorial Day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.